Good afternoon or good day, whatever. Good day to all, and thank you for staying on to this last module of this ASPA meeting. I think most of us love to cruise along during the anesthesia, right? But there will be occasions where we'll be challenged, our vigilance will be challenged, our competence will be challenged. And I have today four very experienced pediatric anesthetists who will share their heart-stopping moments with you. Next. And some ground rules. All right. Um, number one, uh, to type your questions in, you click on the live discussion. Then you will see the question tab appear. Then you type your questions. Now, these questions will be answered at the end of the four presentations where we address it to our panel list. Next. Next slide, please. There seems to be a little bit of a technical difficulty. Can we move to the next slide, please? All right, okay. So it's my pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Olivia Wijiwira. She's a senior consultant in my department, Department of Pediatric Anesthesia in KK Women's and Children's Hospital, Singapore. She's a cool cucumber at work. But when she's off work, she's actually chill with a glass or a tumbler of whiskey in a fine dining restaurant. Her interests are in pediatric anesthesia, by the way, especially cardiac anesthesia and neuroanesthesia. So without much ado, Oli, can you please share with us your case?
Hi there, everyone. Good afternoon. And uh, thank you, everyone, for staying with us this Sunday afternoon. And thank you, Prof. Agnes, for the very kind introduction. I'm Olivia from Singapore, and we'll be sharing with you our hot stopping experience that happened in February this year during the Chinese New Year period, which is a major holiday in Singapore. I have no conflicts of interest to declare other than the interest in uh, F1 in Brazil this weekend, where hopefully this heart stopping moment doesn't recur again. So to the case, my patient is a two-year-old ex-premature child with mild language delay, who is otherwise well, and he presented to us with two-week history of persistent low-grade fever, abdominal distension, and bloating. The child was very fretful on admission. He was tachycardic with a heart rate of 150 per minute and tachypnic with a heart rate of 33 to 50 per minute. On clinical examination, he was found to have reduced air entry over the right chest, a very distended abdomen similar to the child you see in the picture, and hepatosplenomegaly was felt on clinical examination. This is a picture of his chest x-ray which shows a markedly elevated right hemidiaphragm that was pushed upwards. Also, a lung nodule can be seen on the right side of the chest x-ray. The child then underwent a CT scan and an MRI, which revealed a 15 by 11 by 11 cm massive liver tumor at the dome of the right lobe. And the right middle and hepatic veins were obliterated by the tumor, extending all the way into the inferior vena cava and the right atrium. And the right atrium is uh, the right atrial tumor moving into the heart is uh, illustrated by the blue arrow and could be seen entering the right ventricle in diastole. In addition, there were also multiple bilateral pulmonary nodules that were reported on the scans. So this child was diagnosed to have an extensive right hepatoblastoma with extensive inferior vena cava and atrial thrombus with pulmonary metastases, for which he underwent several cycles of chemotherapy with resultant thrombocytopenia, and his usual platelet counts were less than 50,000, and he had significant anemia as well with a baseline hemoglobin of 9 to 8 to 10 grams per deciliter. And the child now presents to us for extended right hepatectomy, inferior vena cava resection, right atrial thrombectomy, and construction of a left hepatic vein graft from the remnant liver all the way to the right atrium. Essentially, this is a liver tumor resection surgery that also required cardiopulmonary bypass. Now, in the literature, there are quite a few surgical case reports, but really none in the anesthesia journals and certainly not in the pediatric anesthesia journals to describe the anesthesia challenges faced for such a major surgery. So, it, uh, in order to proceed with a smooth anesthetic, we needed to have a clear plan of action. And in order to do that, we must first anticipate the potential challenges. And I'd like everyone at this point to participate in the poll. So please do help to identify the anticipated challenges and tick all the options that you think will apply. And I'll give five to 10 seconds for the poll results to come in. Right, looking at the responses for the polls, um, I see that 15% have picked acid base and electrolyte imbalance, 9% uh, have picked logistics, 18% have picked hemodynamic stability, blood loss, 13% uh, hypothermia, 14% surgical plan, and 15% cardiac arrest. And indeed, this was our laundry list of um, anticipated challenges. Certainly, understanding the surgical plan will help plan the anesthetic and anticipate points during which trouble is expected. Hemodynamic stability can certainly be an issue during the times when the intermittent Pringle maneuver is performed during liver dissection. 
And also major blood loss can be expected because of the sheer size of the liver tumour to be removed, as well as the need for heparinization to go on to cardiopulmonary bypass for removal of the atrial thrombus. And uh, with the sheer exposure of the thoracoabdominal cavity and anticipated long duration of surgery, we can expect to have severe hypothermia along with acid base and electrolyte imbalances. Certainly, space constraints within the theatre was, was a difficulty for us as well because our theatres are not very large. And in this case, we needed to support two teams, the cardiac team with the surgeons, perfusionists and the bypass machine, as well as the hepatobiliary team with all their liver equipment. So for, to that end, we chose to pick a cardiac theatre, which was generally a little bit bigger in size, and that could support the cardiopulmonary bypass for this case. And finally, crisis management also needs to be discussed preoperatively because there is a significant risk of intraoperative pulmonary embolism occurring with a very large and mobile atrial thrombus. So intermittent Pringle maneuver is a surgical technique that is employed to reduce bleeding during liver surgery and in essence by clamping the hepatoduodenal ligament, um, the inflow to the hepatic artery and portal vein will be occluded and this will help to minimize blood loss during parenchymal resection. And for us as anesthetists, the physiological effects can be a decrease in cardiac output of up to 10%, an increase in the LV afterload of 20 to 30%, we can see hypertension after clamp release and acidosis can ensue with prolonged intermittent Pringle maneuver. During which time, our goals would be to maintain euvolemia to ensure proper end organ perfusion without too high a central venous pressure, at the same time propping up the blood pressure with vasoconstrictors such as phenylephrine and noradrenaline infusion and close monitoring of the acid-base balance. So since major blood loss is anticipated for this surgery, we considered using the cell saver for this child with this advanced liver tumour. So right now, I'd like to poll the audience again. Do you think the use of cell saver in this child is safe if he's undergoing major tumour surgery? And I'll give about 5 to 10 seconds for everyone to in indicate your poll options on the polling tab. Right. I see that 60% have indicated no and 40% have indicated yes. Thank you everyone for participating in the poll. And the answer is actually yes. It is safe to use a cell saver for pediatric tumor surgery and it is recommended that leukocyte depletion filters be used for the reinfusion of blood. One thing to note about the, these filters is that the flow of blood through these filters is actually quite slow. So if we do need to give blood and transfuse it rather rapidly, we might want to consider using autologous blood instead and saving the cell saver blood and giving it later. And once the salvage blood actually goes through the collection, the processing and the filtering process, the tumor cells would have been uh, undergone morphological changes and been rendered non-viable. And in clinical studies, patients who receive salvage blood had no difference in the distant metastatic rate compared to those who receive other forms of blood transfusion. And specific to this case, this child already had metastatic disease and had been treated with chemotherapy prior to surgery. So when should we consider cell salvage for all our patients? The Association of Anesthetists Guidelines published in 2018 recommends the use of cell salvage when it can be expected to reduce the likelihood of red blood cell transfusion and or severe post-op anemia. And now I'd like to poll our delegates again to ask what volume of anticipated blood loss would trigger you to consider the use of a cell saver? Is it more than 5 mils per kilo, more than 8 mils per kilo, more than 10 mils per kilo, or more than 20% of total blood volume loss? And from our poll results, I see that 71% have picked more than 20% of the blood volume loss and 24% have picked more than 10 mils per kilo. So according to their guidelines, um, we can consider the use of cell saver when we anticipate the blood loss to exceed more than 8 mils per kilogram or more than 10% of the calculated blood volume in children weighing above 10 kilograms.
And just some practical uh, aspects of using the cell saver in children. The typical bowl size that we use in adults is anywhere between 225 to 250 ml bowl, depending on your institution. And generally, this requires about 500 to 700 ml of shed blood to properly fill before processing. But uh, smaller bowls, like the 125 ml bowls, can be used for smaller kids, and that generally requires less shed blood for adequate processing. And some manufacturers now make even smaller bowl sizes. And uh, the hematocrit of the collect, uh, the, the typical hematocrit of salvage blood that is reinfused is generally between 55 to 70 percent. But really, that depends on the quality of the blood collected. So, what are some absolute contraindications to using cell salvage blood? This is a multiple choice question. So, please, uh, we'd like to poll the audience again to select all the choices that you think may apply. And I see that up to 55% have picked contaminated blood, 11% have picked sickle cell anemia, 30% have picked sepsis, and 4% have picked pheochromocytoma. So absolute contraindications would include one, definite sepsis, for example, where there is an intra-abdominal abscess or bowel perforation. Two, where there are the fluids or contaminants that can cause cell lysis. And three, surgery for the removal of pheochromocytoma because the vasoactive molecules can be active upon reinfusion of the salvage blood. Some of the relative contraindications would include beta-thalassemia, sickle cell anemia, and blood containing agents that promote clotting, for example, the use of surgical cell or contaminants like bone semen, fat, or amniotic fluid. Uh, or any substances which we would not want to give intravenously. During this time, the cell saver should not be used. And, however, its use can be resumed once the surgical field is adequately washed with saline. So staying on the topic of uh, major blood loss and blood transfusion, after a combined discussion with the cardiothoracic and hepatobiliary surgeons, our agreement was to order one litre of packed red blood cells, 500 bills of fresh frozen plasma, and 500 ml of platelets for this patient, in addition to the use of cell saver. And because this boy also had a reaction to blood transfusion products, we decided to dose a transfusion pre-medication with IV diphenhydramine every eight hourly. But surgical desire is often different from anesthetic reality. And our estimated blood loss ended up being 4 litres, and we transfused a total of 2.5 litres of red blood cell, with cell saver blood constituting about 25% of the transfused blood. All, all of the cell saver blood was given after coming off cardiopulmonary bypass, after reversal of heparin, along with the fresh frozen plasma and the platelets. So to my next poll question for the audience, what would you use to guide transfusion for this child? This is a multiple choice question, so please take all that apply. I see that 35% have chosen point of care hemoglobin, 32% have chosen clinical judgment, 26% have chosen viscoelastic assays, and 6% have chosen arterial blood gas. And that is right. But while we employed various point-of-care testing devices for this case, certainly it is no replacement for a good clinical judgment, which is always paramount. I feel that there is no amount of blood products that can correct a suture or a diatomy deficiency. But for this patient, uh, we use various point-of-care testing devices to guide the uh, to guide the correction of uh, blood products as well as acid base for this patient. So we use the HemoQ to guide transfusion of PEC cells, uh, ACT to guide the reversal of heparin. We did serial arterial blood gases and lactates to correct the acidosis and electrolytes. 
and we perform viscoelastic testing in the form of rotational thromboelastometry to guide the use of clotting products for this patient. Because if you recall, there would be a synthetic left hepatic vein graft to the right atrium, and this would be the sole outflow of the liver, and we certainly did not want to overtransfuse the clotting products that will potentially lead to left hepatic vein thrombosis and compromise the blood flow to the remaining liver segment. Now, this is the patient's uh, Rotem, showing the FIPTEM as well as the ECTEM that was done after coming off bypass, following reversal with protamin and uh, transfusion of 20 mils per kilo of platelets. Since the A10 on the FIPTEM was low at 5 mm and the XTEM showed an otherwise robust clot, it was indicative of a fibrinogen deficiency. So to my next polling question, would you use fibrinogen concentrate or cryoprecipitate in this choice uh, in this child? I see that over one hundred percent have uh, chosen to use fibrinogen concentrate, and certainly that was our option for this child. Um, we are fortunate in Singapore because at our institution we have both uh, cryoprecipitate and fibrinogen concentrate. And this slide illustrates some of the differences between fibrinogen concentrate and cryoprecipitate. Uh, for this child, with the, we anticipated that he would have a large amount of blood transfusion, and certainly we wanted to minimize the volume of blood products that we had to give in order to avoid any transfusion-associated circulatory overload. In addition, fibrinogen concentrate offers the benefit of a more accurate dosing as compared to the inter-unit inter variability of fibrinogen content with every unit of cryoprecipitate. Um, fibrinogen concentrate is available immediately and easy to dilute, as opposed to cryoprecipitate, which would require us to call up the blood bank for them to thaw it and transport it to our theatre. That alone takes about 30, 30 minutes. Uh, for this already immunocompromised kid who was on receiving chemotherapy, it would confer lower infectious risk. And since he already had a history of blood transfusion reactions, it would also reduce the incidence of uh, allergic and immunologic reactions occurring. Of course, uh, fibrinogen concentrate may not be available in all centres and neither may cryoprecipitate depending on where you live. Uh, the cost of fibrinogen concentrate may be prohibitive to some and in the very small patients, there might be significant amounts of wastage because as far as uh -huh. I understand, the lowest amount would be uh, one gram. There might be some licensing limitations in different institutions. And uh, of course, fibrinogen concentrate alone is not sufficient to correct clotting because it doesn't contain other hemostatic factors that are required for coagulation. And so to complete the story for this patient, earlier we mentioned the mobile right atrial tumor thrombus, and certainly the risk of intraoperative pulmonary embolism occurring would be very high. And we did discuss as a team how to manage should it occur. And to that end, we got the cardiac surgeons to do an early synotomy and to do an early vascular identification with ties placed around the superior vena cava and the pulmonary artery so that if necessary, the pulmonary artery could quickly be clamped and hopefully the patient could go on bypass early. We talked about applying eyes to the head. We discussed the utility of uh, intraoperative TEE and even the role of cardiac massage to break up any massive uh, pulmonary embolism clot. So throughout the case, we kept the perfusionists, the cardiac surgeons, and the scrub nurses within the operating theatre and had heparin drawn up from the start. And I would, to this day, I would like to believe that the very detailed planning actually contributed somewhat in preventing an actual pulmonary embolism because these are some of the intraoperative photos of the atrial thrombus, which really resembles a cauliflower. And looking at its size, we were very thankful that the need to do cardiopulmonary resuscitation did not arise. And I would like to conclude my talk by sharing the timeline of our 18-hour journey that day. But in retrospect and reflection, it really pales in comparison to the heart-stopping moments this child and his parents have faced from his diagnosis to this day. And over here, I would also like to thank the team that helped me in supporting this case, especially to our anesthetic nurses, because without you, we could not have done it. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Olivia, for sharing uh, the case in such a comprehensive step-by-step -step manner. And now we have Dr. Pichaya Wataya Winyu um, from, she's an Associate Professor of um, 
Anesthesiology from the Department of Anesthesiology, Sri Raj Hospital, Mahidol Hospital. Uh, to recently, she, um, she just stepped down as the um, Honorary Secretary of the Aspire School. And uh, she is a mother of two boys, and she loves cooking, um, running, and traveling. And I know she dances very well, too, because I've seen her at the uh, Aspa in Surabaya quite a few years ago, when we still, still could meet face to face. Okay, all yours, Pichaya. Thank you, Dr. Agnes. I just would like to um, thank ASPA Education Committee for having me here. So I have no conflict of interest. So I have a case. She is an eight-month-old girl who was just transferred from provincial hospital just one day earlier in order to manage her condition of failure to thrive. Uh, so she was eight months old, but her current weight was just 2.6 kilos. So she is an uh, ex-28 weekers. She had multiple uh, consequences of prematurities, including her lungs. Uh, right now she has BPD lungs. She had a history of intubation for five months since she was born. And they were able to extubate her three months ago. And she had uh, multiple surgery from her bowel problem, currently having ileostomy and on TPN. She has GI dysfunction. She has eyes problems. She has hypothyroidism. She has osteopenia and anemia. So she, we first met her on um, Friday afternoon in the prep area. At that time, she was on oxygen cannula, one liter per minute. Her vital signs were all quite stable. Uh, oxygen saturation at that time was, not, was 98%. Um, she breathed quite fast, uh, and we noticed that she had mild suprasternal retraction. She had a lot of secretion, and she has um, subtle inspiratory spiral, which is not in the uh, medical chart. Um, and her abdomen is quite distended. So she received continuous NG feeding at the rate of seven meals per six hours, which was on hold for one hour. So they asked us to put a central line for a hyperalimentation. So at this point, if you are about to anesthetize her, what is your anesthesia plan? So please choose one option in the poll box. It can be general anesthesia or general anesthesia with RSI or sedation. Thank you. So most people choose general anesthesia with RSI and I completely agree with that. So we proceed with that. Um, as you can see here, it's just really difficult to monitor her clinically once the drape is on her like this. So there's another concern for us as well, that she is having stridor. So what do you think is the most likely cause of stridor in this patient? Please choose one option from laryngomalacia, subglottic stenosis, um, gastric reflux, or secretion obstruction. So well, thank you very much. Most of you choose um, laryngomalacia or tracheomalacia. And we shall see what happened in this case later on. So back to our case, we perform rapid sequence induction, we pre-oxygenation, and we give thiopental succinylcholine. And when we perform direct laryngoscopy with middle blade, my resident said, oh, there is a mass at larynx and I cannot see vocal cords. Okay, so she was the only one who saw this picture. So basically what she saw is a big papilloma here. So if you see the picture oh, like that, when you perform direct laryngoscope, what would you do? Please choose one option. You want to pass the tube? Or you think that it would be nice to put the LMA? Or you want to wake the patient up? Thank you. So 
everyone choose to pass the endotracheal tube, which exactly what we did. The reason why we did that is because um, it seems like her clinical uh, on the respiration is not that bad. So the, we kind of certain that her airway patency is still good. So we attempt pushing the endotracheal tube down and, we, and it went in successfully. Then we perform central line placement at left internal jugular vein using an ultrasound guide. Um, and here come the part of the end of anesthesia and we have to make decision if we can extubate her or not. So that is the time that we pull the video laryngoscope and we shall see what happened. So we try to pull the tube out there. All right. So, would you extubate? All right, thank you. So, um, we leave the endotracheal tube in place, and then the patient was transferred to PQ uh, for ventilatory support. And then pediatric ENT was subsequently consulted for further management. So back to the problem of her upper airway obstruction. It seems like um, if you look back in the polls, it seems to be a lot of possibilities in this case. So uh, this table shows common airway lesions that can cause upper airway obstruction in pediatric population. Um, so there will be div uh, varies in, in the um, diagnosis, uh, depends on the level of obstruction from pharynx and supraglottic glottic, subglottic, and tracheal um, lesion. Uh, and this diagnosis uh, actually depends on the patient's age and symptoms and everything. And also, if you notice that uh, the patient had uh, uh, inspiratory stridor. So her symptoms indicate that she have uh, she is having problems at the level of supraglottic or vocal cords level, which match uh, what the thing that you saw already. So when we have a patient who comes in with, with stridor, so the timing, severity, character, and associated symptoms like fever or reflux or uh, mass usually help us to differentiate the cause of stridor so that we'll be able to prepare what we would see in the patient. So I will now gonna um, tell you the story of her that uh, about the treatment that she subsequently received. So she uh, was scheduled for the L telescopy, CO2 laser and biopsy under general anesthesia. So the possibility of anesthesia techniques for the laser airway surgery can be using two or tubeless technique. Uh, when we decide to use the tube technique, the airway is well established. So the patency is good and uh, the uh, prevention of aspiration is better than the tubeless technique. However, a tube can cause a higher risk of airway fire. So we need a special tube or at least we have to wrap the tube with aluminum foil in order to prevent airway fire. So for the tubeless technique, um, we can go with jet ventilation or others. Uh, for jet ventilation, uh, this is not an well-established airway. And um, because the jet flow can depends on the um, how, how we ventilate. So sometimes it's under ventilation. So the patient's baseline lungs condition should be good enough. Jet ventilation needs experienced hand and require good team communications. For other tubeless technique that we can perform is spontaneous ventilation, which can preserve the patient's negative intrathoracic pressure. So the surgeon be able to perform dynamic and functional assessment of glottis. Uh, for apneic oxygenation is still another option, but the patient can develop hypercarbia. And for high flow oxygen delivery is not very common use, but um, you is still be able to do that, but just have to um, to uh, worry about the uh, area fire more. I'm going to 
going to talk about the jet ventilation techniques a little bit, but uh, in this talk, I will not mention about the transtracheal jet ventilation technique. So supraglottic technique, basically, we ventilate through the side port of suspension laryngoscope. So the uh, ability that we can ventilate the patient depends on uh, how good that the ENT surgeon uh, apply the suspension laryngoscope. So the patient will have um, a risk of hypoventilation, a risk of gastric distension, and with this um, equipment, we are unable to monitor entitled CO2. And for subglottic jet ventilation, basically we put a catheter, a very small one, through the vocal cord, and then we ventilate through the jet. And um, this is nice, but um, uh, because this is nice because we can reduce the peak airway pressure and this will not produce any vocal cord motion at all. But the patient will have higher risk of barotrauma and uh, there, if there's some fracture of the catheter, that will be a problem because the distal fragment may be pushed into the patient's lungs. I will show you different uh, equipment for jet ventilation. This is manual jet that we can use it manually or control by yourself, everything. And this is another manual jet ventilation, but this has an active um, expiratory phase because they have suction uh, function there. And it's recommended to be used with this kind of catheter that put um, into uh, uh, the subglottic area with a balloon and with many lumens that you can use for monitor airway pressure and internal CO2. These are uh, example of uh, subglottic uh, jet ventilation catheter as well. To provide more safety, this machine can be used to uh, give jet ventilation automatically. So, and uh, it can reduce the FiO2 as we wish. So in summary, jet ventilation for laser airway surgery, we need well collaborative plan in surgical and anesthesia team. Before we start, we have to review patient's airway pathology so that we can choose the technique that is best for your patient. And in this kind of patient, sedation premedication usually contraindicated because the patient usually have some degree of um, upper airway obstruction. Anticholinergic is recommended. Uh, we can induce the patient to sleep using um, inhalation induction if the patient has no IV in place. However, uh, to be on the safe side, uh, you should have IV line and we can use IV line to, uh, to induce the patient to sleep uh, in the titrate fashion. For the maintenance, uh, intravenous route is more preferred. Topical anesthesia is good and it is um, desired to reduce the dose of anesthetic agent. You can use mesorelaxant and it's recommended to give dexamethasone and when we perform jet ventilation, the laser must be off. We start at low pressure and titrate up to see uh, effect of chest, uh, visible chest rise. And we have to monitor patient's oxygenation and uh, if we can with the uh, internal CO2 with the equipment. So for jet ventilation, the risk of airway fire is not zero. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the uh, airway fire. So uh, when we uh, perform this kind of case, we have to make sure that the surgical drape is not um, aligned in, uh, in a way that can accumulate uh, oxygen. And um, we have to allow sufficient drying time if we use um, for the skin prep. And um, we use moistened gauze, sponge and gauze in the area. The team has to be agreed and understand their own role in order to prevent and manage an airway fire. And we have to notify the surgeon every single time that we put the patient on high FiO2. And if the cough endotracheal tube is, is uh, used, it's better than using a non-cuff because it can prevent um, oxygen into the uh, area of laser. And every single time, when we about to start the laser, we have to announce that the laser is about to be on 
we have to reduce the oxygen and we have to stop using nitrous oxide. And when every fire happens, we stop laser immediately, remove tracheal tube, stop all the gas flow, remove spuns and other flammable material from the airway. We flush saline into the airway. Uh, and if the fire is kind of extended to the OR, we have to use CO2 fire extinguisher and transfer patient out of the OR. We re-establish ventilation and re-examination how severe the airway um, damage is. So in this case, we uh, only have this kind of equipment in our hospital. So we use the uh, supraglottic jet ventilation technique. The patient was transferred to the OR. We gave, um, uh, she was still intubated at that time. We gave atropine. We put it on propofol TCI and we give muscle relaxant. They perform debulking of the uh, lesion that you saw uh, earlier. And then we pull the endotracheal tube out. They did a re -ex uh, they did an exam with a, a CO2 laser on the lesions. And then after they finish up with everything, we put the endotracheal tube back and uh, send her back to the PQ. And these are the operative findings, the large papilloma here and small papilloma here. So in summary, this case, um, this is actually not a, a hard stop um, case, but anyway, it's a kind of surprise for me as well. So uh, for the stride or even if it's a subtle one, uh, it can mean something to the patient and the stridor characteristic can guide us about the level of airway obstruction. Um, and if we use jet ventilation, uh, it requires communication and experienced hand to perform the best care of your patient and always prevent and know how to manage airway fire. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Pichaya. Though it was not a heart-stopping moment for you, nevertheless, keeping a cool head and making correct decisions is very, very important. So now I go on to a very good friend, Associate Professor Serpil Osijan from the University of Achibadan, Istanbul, Turkey. Um, she's actively involved in the educational activities uh, of ASPA, and we're very grateful for her, uh, her experience. And um, today, she'll be sharing Another potentially heart-stopping moment. All yours, Abhil. Good afternoon, uh, my dear my colleagues and ASPA friends, ASPA family. It's uh, my honor to be with you, even if it's uh, online. Uh, I miss you all. Uh, this was a great meeting. Thank you for organizing for the uh, IT and the all organizing committee. They, they did a great job here. Now, uh, I want to share a, a case of uh, not mine, but my friend's case. It was a heart stopping moment. Uh, luckily, we did not end up in a nightmare. Uh, she was a bleeding tonsillectomy and she was obese and she came at night shift. At 9 p.m., the emergency call from the ward, they said that they had a possibility of bleeding tonsillectomy. She was four, four years old, but they weighed 45 kilograms. Uh, and uh, she is uh, agitated and pale. Heart rate a bit tachycardic, 130. The spider rate is 30 minutes per uh, 30 per minute. And her capillary refill is four seconds. And she had a tonsillectomy on that day on the morning schedule. And the oncologist anesthesiologist is occasionally managing children in his practice. I know you are saying that uh, we would like to have the strength of the chair and the fate of the duck in this case, since we have some thrilling points. At night shift, the anesthetist occasionally anesthetizes children, uh, and we need a quick preparative evaluation of the child because she is in crisis. Uh, we had problems related to the bleeding tonsillectomy and also uh, problems related to the obesity. We have a, we should have a good plan of induction, ventilation, airway control, and maintenance. And also extubation is very important as well as the possibility of analgesia. 
As you know, adenectomy and tonsillectomy are the most common operations. The incidence of bleeding following tonsillectomy is 0.5 to 2, depending on the upon the surgical technique. The primary bleeding occurs within 24 hours of surgery, and the secondary uh, bleeding. Uh, up to 28 days post surgery this is as associated with uh, the overlying tons uh, the scar of the uh, overlying tonsillary bed as you know the blood supply to the tonsils is through the external carotid artery and its branches and the venous return is to the places around the tonsillar capsule and we are lucky that the post post tonsillectomy bleeding is usually venous in origin uh, there are two surgical techniques, uh, and the hot surgical technique, uh, which uh, is done by diatomy or uh, radiofrequency coblation, has a risk of postoperative hemorrhage. Uh, however, the traditional tonsillectomy, called steel tonsillectomy, uses surgical instruments without the use of diatomy. This uh, tonsillectomy technique has more intraoperative bleeding. However, uh, it has a less postoperative pain and less postoperative bleeding. So, if the child uh, who will undergo the tonsillectomy is living uh, away from you or uh, uh, far away from the hospital, it's better to be at the safe size, uh, side and uh, use cold steel tonsillectomy. What about immediate management? What do you think? Uh, we need high flow of oxygen uh, via assessment as much as the ch child tolerates. We need a quick assessment of the respiratory distress. We have to assess the volume studies and optimize the child. We need a good IV line if we are lucky. And as soon as we put the IV, we should send blood for blood count and cross match and coagulation param parameters. We have to restrict the child with IV fluids, blood products if necessary. We have to prepare the theater meanwhile and call for senior help. And please do not delay transfer to the theater for hemostasis. Uh, as we uh, assess the child, we have to know the times in surgery, how, what analgesics are used, what opioids and reversal agents has been used, the time uh, last ingestion of food we should know. The pres there will be clots in the mouth, but this is not the real amount. There will be concealed blood loss and the uh, stomach may be full of blood. Any signs of airway difficulty? Do we hear any stridor or any intercostal or tracheal recessions? We have, if we can reach, we have to examine the previous anesthetic chart in order to decide the size of the tracheal tube and the analgesia administered and any airway difficulties noted. So, what kind of fluid will you use during recitation of this child? You may choose more than one option. Uh, will it be a lactated ringer? or uh, saline or albumin or uh, saline and dextrose. Good. But uh, when you are uh, restating uh, in, in a child like this, please use isotonic crystalloids, uh, colloids, or if you need blood. IV boluses of fluid, please start with 20 miles per kilogram. Repeat if necessary after reassessment of the cardiovascular system. You may need large volumes of fluid, 40 to 60 miles per kilogram, but if you need more, please use albumin or uh, according to the bleeding, you can use blood. Hypotonic fluids must not be used in acute recitation of hypovolemic children. And uh, is this shock, uh, is it compensated or uncompensated? Uh, you remember the child, she is four years old, 45 kilograms, she is agitated, pale, heart rate is uh, tachycardic, respiratory rate is high, capillary period is four seconds. So, uh, as you see, it's... Uh, for, uh, she's tachycardic, 130 minutes. Uh, respiratory rate is high. Um, and the capillary fill is four seconds. Uh, the uh, organ perfusion is, is a bit uh, delayed, uh, but uh, we don't measure the blood pressure. Uh, but remember, uh, blood pressure is the late sign of hypovolemic shock. If, it, if she's hypotensive, uh, it's very late. Uh, this is a compensated uh, shock, but um, uh, 
we can measure the urinary output, uh, which may be affected during shock. Uh, core and skin temperature difference is also important. If it's more, more than two degrees difference, it's an important sign of shock. And if we can send the blood gas analysis and see metabolic acidosis, it's a, a late shock. Uh, what do we consider when we are giving anesthetics to the bleeding tonsils? First, we have a potential hypovolemic shock. So we have a child of hemodynamic instability. She, uh, she will be dehydrated, so we need volume dilatation. She may uh, be at the risk of pulmonary aspiration, of regurgitated swallow blood or postoperative oral intake, and we should as assume that she, is, she has full stomach. And also, these are uh, potential difficult airway uh, babies, and uh, we may have a difficulty in intubation. Bleeding obscures the wheel. We cannot see the, uh, anything in the mouth. Uh, your breathing systems may be uh, bloody. So, uh, the, and also edema from the previous area instrumentation and surgery uh, may be may make it difficult. And also, we are applying a second general anesthetic. This will be risky as well. And also, she is obese. Uh, what are the problems related uh, to obesity? First, uh, she may have the situation, area position, and difficulty. Uh, very difficult intravenous assess may be uh, uh, obscure our way. Uh, we may have ventilation and intubation difficulties, uh, and also she has residue anesthetic, and regurgitation and aspiration uh, is a problem, and also the drugs, pharmacokinetics and dynamics of the drugs in obese children are different. So, uh, as a team, we need senior help. So, please call senior help. We need at least two helpers at the operating theaters for us. The surgeon and the surgical assistant should be scrubbed and ready with all instruments. The operating sh theater should be prepared prior to induction and all equipment should be tested. Uh, all equipment should be available for immediate use, checked before, turned on, and at least two of each equipment you will need. Two suction devices with wide bore tubing, yank your hands open, and you will be ready for aspiration. Laryngoscopes, please use correct blades of uh, correct size of blades and also you will need video laryngoscope because you may see nothing uh, but blood in the mouth. Uh, cuffed and tracheal tubes are used and uh, the size, uh, if you know the size used previously is okay and plus a half size smaller in case of laryngeal edema should be ready. You should have uh, white ball or gastric tubes to empty the stomach blood at the end of the procedure. You may need two breathing systems since blood may come into them. Uh, the obesity pillow helps you. You may not have something uh, luxurious like this, but you may uh, have it in your operating theater made by yourselves. It's easier for oxygenation, mask ventilation, two-handed mask ventilation and intubation. The obese child should be uh, spine upright and rapid sequence induction and uh, cricoid pressure should be applied during, uh, during intubation and ventilation. And which one of the following agents will you prefer for induction? You may choose one, do one of more, or more, one, more than one option. Uh, will you choose thiopentane or ketamine or sevoflurane or low dose propofol or hurricane? So as an induction, whatever you use, it's, uh, it should be modified rapid sequence induction with, rapid, uh, with cricoid pressure if you can do, but uh, sometimes it's uh, not so effective. Uh, IV is preferred if you are lucky to put the IV uh, and low dose propofol or ketamine or midazolam, opioids and dexmethotomidine are all acceptable. Uh, mask ventilation without excess pressure, if possible. Uh, you can use succinamethanium and rocuronium prior to intubation. And please keep in mind risk of hypoxia if intubation is difficult and spontaneous respiration has been lost. The anesthetists should adopt an approach with, with which they are comfortable and cognizant of the potential hazards. Uh, if you don't have an IV, you may go for inhalation induction, which is uh, will be very extremely difficult in an anxious child who is bleeding. 
and also uh, deep anesthesia, particularly re recovering from anesthesia, if you are earlier, will be risky. And also, uh, there is a risk of cardiac arrest at a child hypovolemic if you use a special for halotain. But inhalation induction is familiar to all, all of us, and oxygenation well maintained during spontaneous ventilation. Uh, if the child was not obese, the uh, lateral position will help us to drain blood and clots and gently su suction. Uh, for intravenous uh, rapid sequent induction, it may be impossible to adequately pre -oxygenate and uh, oxygenate an anxious child who is bleeding. Fast mass ventilation should be done very uh, carefully in order not to inflate the stomach since it, there may be regurgitation and aspiration. Uh, since we will be using muscle relaxants, this will uh, produce ideal conditions for us. Uh, but the drugs uh, should be arranged to lean body weights or ideal body weights according to the pharmacokinetics in obese children. Uh, the lean body weight, uh, in order to calculate it before the operation, we have to calculate uh, or uh, do we have to keep these charts in our operating rooms. Uh, like our uh, child is four years old, and uh, sh the lean body weight, according to this child, uh, uh, arranged for uh, percentiles, is 15 uh, kilograms. Or you can use the uh, Callahan's uh, nomogram, uh, you can draw a line from the uh, age of the child uh, to passing through the high, and you can see the ideal body weight, which is uh, 22. And from the ideal body weight, you can draw a line to total body weight, and you can see the uh, lean body mass is 29 kilograms. Uh, and the propofol is used for lean body weight or ideal body weight, either will do, but infusion should be total body weight arranged. Uh, ketamine uh, can be used for ideal body weight. If you, you, we use opioids and it, they should be, the induction dose should be total by the weight, but maintenance should be arranged to ideal body weight. Remifentanil is used for lean body weight. Uh, how to extubate the child? if she is like this, a lean, uh, um, tiny girl. Uh, we, the lateral reversed and full awake position, head down position will be good. But in obese children, it's impossible to do this. And uh, they should be extubated upright, semi-sitting. And uh, the extubation decision should be uh, done after the open hemostasis is OK. Uh, and regarding to the perioperative care, uh, we should follow the fluids and blood, hemoglobin and blood gas, and uh, give if necessary. Monitorization should be continued, heart rate, capillary field, the uh, difference between the core and te peripheral temperatures and blood pressure should be monitorized. Hypothermia is important since coagulopathy may aggravate the uh, uh, coagulation. Once hemostasis is achieved, we should uh, pass a large bore gastric tube or uh, be careful with the uh, wound around the uh, tonsil tonsils uh, under direct vision. And extubate the child with no uh, uh, muscle relaxants reversed and fully awake. Uh, regarding the post-operative care, we have to monitor the uh, child in a closely lit, well lit area with reg regular vital parameters. Uh, if we uh, should monitor hemoglobin and coagulation strain and give blood if necessary, minimum hemoglobin 8 is acceptable if there is no further bleeding. Uh, and the uh, child should remain in hospital for at least 24 hours after surgery if no transfusion has been required. So, bleeding tonsillectomy in an obese child. If you are a less experienced anesthetist for pediatric crisis, uh, please call for senior help. And anesthesia residents, technicians, nurses should be ready for every pedi pediatric anesthesia crisis. And this readiness can be uh, achieved by perioperative pediatric life support courses, anesthesia education programs, and simulations. And so safe anesthesia at these at case, case scenarios can be applied. But please do not hesitate to call for help. And uh, thank you for uh, sharing the case with me. Uh, and Thank you for the organizing committee for inviting me and giving the opportunity to share the case. And we uh, want to see you face to face uh, next in next Aspa 22, 2022 in Istanbul, Turkey. All welcome. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Sapil. 
for sharing this case, which can go horribly wrong if it was in wrong hands, actually. Um, and now we move on to Associate Professor Teresita Batane, uh, who is works at the Philippines Children's Medical uh, Center. She's also very active in the uh, education activities of ASPA and has been with, with us work um, in, a, in the Pediatric Perioperative Life Support course since its inception in 2015. So she also has, um, she enjoys biking. In fact, she goes long distance biking with her, her daughter and the son. And she keeps very fit that way. So without much ado, Tess, can you uh, please share with us your case? A good day to all of you. My heart stopping case from sleep to nightmares. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Agnes, Professor Agnes, for your kind introduction. And I'd like to thank ASPA for this opportunity to share this case. I have no conflict of interest to uh, declare. Our case, a patient who is a healthy 11-month-old infant who is undergoing palatoplasty. General anesthesia is going smoothly with a surgeon silently going about their repair. Suddenly, the entitled CO2 decreased from 35 to 10 millimeters mercury, but the O2 saturation remains at 99%. Uh, this is our first polling question. What will be your immediate course of action? Please choose one. Letter A, auscultate the lungs and check apnogram. B, immediately stop the surgery and inspect the operative site. C, turn off the ventilator and do manual bagging. D, take vital signs and listen to the heart tones. Okay, the results came in. Most will choose auscultating the lungs and checking the capnogram. And 50% uh, will turn off the ventilator and do manual bagging. Let's see in this case. First, the objectives of this case are to discuss the management of an eventful palatoplasty in an infant with sudden drop in entitled CO2 and other capnography waveform changes and to enumerate the possible causes of the sudden drop in entitled CO2 and other events, and to expound on the endotracheal tube used in palatoplasty. So the course of action in our patient, uh, the anesthesiologist, auscultated the lungs and checked the capnogram. The precordial stethoscope, which is in place, the heart sounds are regular and clear, but breath sounds are clear and decreased. So um, seeing this next um, polling question after seeing the patient's capnogram, what are the possible causes of this decrease in entitled CO2? Choose those that apply. Bronchospasm, endotracheal tube obstruction, endotracheal tube cough leak, or endotracheal tube in the hypopharynx. Okay, so for our answers, we have again 50-50, 50% endotracheal tube cough leak and 50% endotracheal tube in the hypopharynx. So the first choice was bronchospasm. And of course, this is different because we, will, we should be able to see the shark fin appearance in the capnogram. And um, listening to the heart tones, uh, to the breath sounds, Usually we will hear wheezes to absent breath sounds if the bronchospasm is severe. But in our patient, the breath sounds are clear, although decreased. 
and the patient has no history of asthma. And as we have been told, anesthesia is going smoothly with a stable patient. This is the capnogram of the patient. We don't see the shark fin appearance. There are irregular and very low uh, readings in the entitled CO2. So in this um, capnogram form, we will see this when there is endotracheal cuff leak, endotracheal tube in the hypopharynx, or obstruction in the EP. Complete obstruction, of course, will be no reading at all. But in partial obstruction, this is possible. In the management of our case, we should advise the surgeon to stop the surgery, inform them of the sudden drop in antidal CO2, ask them if they change anything in the setup. But we must keep in mind that our surgeons may not be aware of the implications of moving the retractor or mouth guard that they are using, or they might have forgotten that they changed the setup. So we must inspect the operative site ourselves, check the endotracheal tube. And in this patient, we saw that the cause of the change in antidal CO2 was the endotracheal obstruction, where the Dingman retractor that is being used was moved by the assistant to improve the operative view. It then caused a partial obstruction in the endotracheal tube because of its location and uh, pressure from the Dingman retractor. We must coordinate with the surgeons to adjust the retractor until our capnogram is normal and showing this. And listening to the precordial stethoscope, the breath sounds now are equal clear. We have a next polling question. Later into the surgery, so the surgery was again going smoothly, but later, the capnogram showed this. What will you do to manage this? Please choose one option. Adjust the shoulder roll, deepen the anesthesia, give muscle relaxant, or re-intubate. Okay, so for our answers, we have 83% re-intubate and 17% depend the anesthesia. So in this particular capnogram that we see, there is endotracheal tube dislodgement because there is no more endotracheal tube that, uh, there is no more antidal CO2 that is detected. We see that from the normal tracing, there is a sudden drop to zero, almost zero, of the antidal CO2 reading. This requires rapid response to, be ma to manage the situation. And communication with the surgical team is very important. So we must do reintubation intraoperatively. First, we have to give 100% O2, prepare the airway trolley, inform the surgeons of the accidental extubation, instruct the surgical team to remove the retractor so that we can move freely, remove the needles and gauze because this can get in the airway and be aspirated. And then we have to take over the head part of the patient, immediately inspect the oral cavity with the laryngoscope to see the oral cavity clearly, quickly and gently suction secretions or blood as needed. Mask ventilate as necessary. Remove the shoulder roll that is being used by the surgeon for their improvement of their surgical view. If the patient is waking up, give a hypnotic to rapidly put the patient to sleep, such as propofol. Then we have to do smooth intubation to prevent trauma to incised structures. To facilitate smooth intubation, we can either deepen the anesthesia or top up the muscle relaxant that we are giving to the patient. So reintubation was done in our patient. Um, we have this next polling question. 
After re-intubation, the capnogram showed this. Identify the problem, please choose one option. So is there endobronchial intubation, esophageal intubation, bronchospasm, or endotracheal tube leak? Okay, so our answer, esophageal intubation, 6% and the tracheal tube leak. So uh, our graph so shows esophageal intubation. There is an initial, uh, because at the end we will see that there is no more carbon dioxide that is detected. However, initially, the entitled CO2 reading is present because of your prior bag mask ventilation. Because the air got into the stomach, especially if the bag mask ventilation was prolonged and the CO2 is red initially. But we will see that there is no more carbon dioxide that is detected later on. And we must remember that in patients with cleft palate or palatoplasty, some of them will have, we will have difficult intubation. So in our patient, rocuronium or succinylcholine may be given, and this facilitated a smooth re-intubation. And after that, this was the tracing that we get from the capnography. So we saw that there were many problems encountered in this patient. I have myself, uh, encountered some of these problems, but not all of them. Thank you for that. So we must keep in mind that when we do palatoplasty, we share the airway with the surgeon. And because of that, we have to have constant communication with them, with the surgical team, and also the scrub nurse. All of us are in the team, and we must have uh, communication to make sure that the airway, the shared airway is not compromised. In the monitoring of patients for palatoplasty, uh, the American Society of Anesthesiologists has included, of course, this is for all cases, that capnography getting our entitled CO2 should be included. And this is, all, and this is also part of the standard monitors in the AAGBI. And also for the American Heart Association, they recommend using waveform capnography in ma bag mask ventilation and also in resuscitation. Capnography, we measure, and it also shows graphic display of carbon dioxide levels in the airway using mostly infrared spectroscopy. And this give us instantaneous information about ventilation since carbon dioxide is eliminated by the pulmonary system. And if there is vacuum as much as, as when there is shunt where there is perfusion but no ventilation, or there's dead space where there is ventilation but no perfusion, our entitled CO2 will be abnormally low. Next, uh, instantaneous information that we get from capnography is about perfusion. Since carbon dioxide is transported via the vascular system, the cardiac output carries to the lungs the carbon dioxide that is for exhalation. If there is poor circulation, such as when DP is low, we also have low entitled CO2. And uh, for resuscitation, when there's return of spontaneous circulation, there will be a sudden increase in entitled CO2 that will be seen. Next, instantaneous information that we get is metabolism because carbon dioxide is produced by cellular metabolism. A good example will be in MH, which is an example where there is hypermetabolism. So we get in a very high 
entitled CO2 reading initially. And also in poor metabolism, such as when there's hypothermia or in patients with unstable vital signs, low cardiac output, there will be also low and tidal CO2. So what are the situations where we see decrease in end tidal CO2? So aside from the case that we had, hyperventilation will also show us an increase, a decrease in end tidal CO2. But we see that the waveform, there will be increased frequency. And um, so both the amplitude and the width of the waveform will be decreased. Also, when there's obstruction to airflow, as is seen in asthma because of bronchoconstriction, but again, as was shown earlier, there will be the shark fin appearance of the waveform. Uh, there is a prolonged um, phase two with no alveolar plateau because um, the exit of or the exhalation of carbon dioxide from the alveoli will be from different sizes. Of, uh, depending on the bronchoconstriction, the more bronchoconstricted areas will uh, result in exhalation of carbon dioxide that is more prolonged. So we don't see the alveolar plateau. And also obstruction to airflow in the endotracheal tube. If there is a partial obstruction in the tube, there will also be decrease in entitled CO2. However, when the and the tracheal tube is fully kinked, we see that the decrease in antidote CO2 will be to zero. And other situations where we have sudden drop in antidote CO2 is uh, when there's defective carbon dioxide analyzer. Also when there is total disconnection of the breathing circuit and the endotracheal tube. Also when there's defective ventilator or dislodgement of the endotracheal tube the reading of your entitled CO2 will be zero. This is our last polling question. Which endotracheal tube do you prefer for palatoplasty in an infant? Please choose one option, which is your option. Ar armored tube, uncuffed tube, uncuffed ray tube, cuffed ray tube. Okay, so 77% chose cuff tube, cuff ray tube, 15% uncuff tube, and 8% armor tube. So armor, let us just look at the characteristics of the different tubes that were mentioned. Armor tubes are non-bendable and reinforced. However, they are soft, so we must use guide wire in intubation and there can be a permanent kink from biting on the tube. For the uh, uh, conventional tubes, cuffed or uncuffed, they are readily available. Uncuffed tubes, when there is leak, we can put a gauze pad to um, pack and cover the leak. And we can change the ET to a larger size. For cuffed tubes, less ET size changes will be done because we can adjust the air in the cuff, but then we must use one size smaller than uncuffed tubes. The preformed or ray tube advantage is that the preformed bend falls into the retractor or the mouth gag during palatoplasty that reduces the risk of kinking and obstruction. However, a disadvantage is that the fixed intraoral length from the bend um, to the tip of the tube differs from brand to brand, and there can be accidental endobronchial intubation. And cuff placement can be in the vocal cord or at the level of the subglotic zone, and this can cause post-op strider. The use of uncuffed ray tubes have been, has been seen uh, to have the risk of endobronchial intubation that increases with age. And the use of Cuff tubes 
um, had also its problems. So there's a recommendation to improve the cuff by uh, having a standard bend to tube tip distance and also to have a short cuff that is placed as distally as possible on the tube shaft. And intubation death mark can guide to verify the proper positioning of the cuff in the trachea. So th those recommendations were done. One is by removing the Murphy's eye. This allows the cuff to be placed as distal as possible and closer to the tip of the endotracheal tube shaft. This is seen in the microcuff endotracheal tube. And also intubation or insertion death marks are present. So when there's one mark, that mark should be in the vocal cord. When there are two marks, in between the mark should be the one at the level of the vocal cord. This and um Okay, these uh, marks help us to have a cuff-free subglotic and vocal cord zones. And the risk of endobronchial intubation from birth to adolescence have been seen. And the cuff has been shown to reliably seal the airway of cuff pressures of less than or equal to 10 cm water. And there is no increased risk of post-extubation stridor when we compare this with uncuff EP. So uh, the preformed ray tube with cuff, safe and effective option with low tube size exchange rate and minor complications. So the takeaways, waveform topography changes and interpretations. Uh, we must be uh, always ready to interpret this. Difficult intubation in palatoplasty can be expected. And for the tube that we use for palatoplasty, it depends on availability and the, and the problems that we may encounter, we must keep in mind the possible endobronchial intubation, the placement of the cuff at the subglotic area or on the vocal cord itself can cause post-extubation stridor. And the development of low pressure cuff that is placed distally, as distal as possible on the tube, helps. And the cuff pressure should be maintained at maximum of 20 cm water. Thank you very much. Salamat po in Filipino. I'd like to invite all the panelists uh, to come on now. Thanks, Tess, for sharing with us, um, you know, though a simple case, but it can be a potential nightmare too. Okay, we have about 10 minutes for questions. The first one will be to Dr. Olivia. Um, some institutions do not have ROTEM or TEGs. Are there any alternative point of care that others can use to guide the transfusions? Hi, yes. Um, and I alluded to it. Thank you for the question. Actually, I referred to it earlier in my slide. I think first and foremost is to have good clinical judgment. Um, in a, besides the viscoelastic testing for this case, we did do our basics to make sure that since the patient was uh, requiring cardiovascular bypass, we use the activated clotting time to ensure that heparin is reversed adequately. And uh, we use the hemocule to guide the transfusion of uh, red blood cells and products, as well as the arterial blood gas to monitor for complications, electrolyte complications of over transfusion, like hyperkalemia and hypocalcemia. However, when it comes to actual administration of clotting products, Actually, for this case, I would strongly encourage the use of uh, viscoelastic testing because if you remember, the liver tumor was just so big and whatever would be left was just very, very little. So you really would not want to over transfuse the clotting products and clot off that synthetic graft that was placed. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Ollie. Um, what about um, the, um, you have a massive, obviously you, you, you actually activated the massive uh, transfusion, um, you know, protocol. Um, maybe you could share with us how you planned. Uh, was it um, a plan beforehand or did you just activate it in, as time went on? Um, to be honest, while we have a massive transfusion protocol at our institution, we planned so well that we actually did not need to activate the massive transfusion protocol for this particular case. Uh, what we did was since we had prior knowledge of when the case would be scheduled, we did inform the blood bank uh, to make sure that they would have enough 
products for this patient on the day of surgery itself. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, this is for Pichaya. Um, you know, um, I think one the first question was from um, from Evangeline is, did you use dexamethasone to manage airway edema uh, for the baby? Yes, we do. We give a uh, 0.5 milligram per kilo for uh, dexamethasone in order to reduce airway edema. Okay, and another question from Dr. Serene Lim that, you know, uh, how would you assess um, the risk of a one-way ball valve effect or air trapping with jet ventilation for this papilloma? Right, this is quite important issues that uh, sometimes we be able to ventilate, but uh, in some patients with severe upper airway obstruction, it's just really difficult to, to um, let the... Uh, the expired air out uh, by, you know, whatever uh, ball valve effect or not. So in this case, uh, the patient's already intubated and uh, we discussed with the ENT surgeon. Uh, we, uh, they started with uh, like a debulking of the mask when the tube is still in place. So uh, when uh, the mass, the, uh, the big mass is kind of like uh, out of the way. So um, we able to uh, pull the endotracheal tube out and they, they will uh, continue their work you know, with the CO2 laser. Yes. So, so, so in other words, there was no, it was a partial obstruction and was moving. It was not uh, in a way when the patient expired. So that uh, was decide to, to use a, a jet ventilation? Was that right. If, right. Initially, we ventilate through the tube. Uh, when they did, when they're finishing the debulking of the mass, uh, so we pull the bit, uh, endotracheal tube out, and we can uh, subsequently perform intermittent jet ventilation. The supra. Okay, all right. So, so, yeah. so you face in the um, um, okay. You, you you slowly debulk. Okay, fine. And another question from Li Shuyin: uh, Will the risk of airway fire be less so with a tubeless technique? Which means right, and this is another great question as well. So uh, when the, the airway fire can happen when we have um, flammable material in the airway, right? And uh, in combination with oxygen and, and laser ignition. So if we can get rid of the flammable material in the airway, for example, like the simple endotracheal tube, that will be really helpful. So uh, doing uh, jet ventilation without putting any airway equipment or uh, the infrared jet ventilation through the small catheter, which is a, a laser resistant uh, catheter is really helpful because we, we don't really use the flammable material. Yeah. So uh, the tubeless technique is more preferred uh, as you, uh, if you could really concern on the point of every fire. Okay, all right. This is question is for Dr. Serpil. Um, it comes from Li Shuin also, that if you had an obese, a similar obese patient coming to the OT and the IV has somehow, without an IV, it is it's uncooperative, will you give pre-medication to such a patient. Uh, thank you, uh, Shu Ling. Uh, this is a great question and one of my nightmares, not in this child, but in every child, uncompetitive and no uh, IV lines, uh, agitated family, agitated um, baby. Um, I will try for um, intranasal presedex, uh, dexmetodomidine, uh, but will not be sure if it is perfectly given or perfectly um, absorbed by, because there will be blood everywhere. Um, intramuscular ketamine uh, and uh, together maybe midazolam and maybe positioning the child laterally and transferring to the operating theaters uh, with pulse oximeter uh, under care, it will be safer. So what dose of um, iron ketamine will you be giving? Uh, not usually, not, uh, we don't, I mean, this is not we prefer, but if we are, we have to, we do. Right. I mean, if you had to, then 
what tools would you use if you had uh, to there's always yeah. if you had to <laughs> <laughs> uh i would use uh, why does or uh, dex methodomidin uh, i mean ketamine what what you, you said i am ketamine which is actually not unreasonable uh, but yes but uh, we use uh what 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 do you ask for what dose of i am ketamine ah, those, uh, um, maybe um one one milligrams per kilogram uh up to three okay all right okay thank you uh, thank you. uh another um comment and question and question uh is that i think um for tests mm -hmm. all right um I think Tess, um, I think there was some clarification regarding the sizing of um, a calf uh, for an infant. Uh, what would your recommendations be if it was an infant which is 12 months and below uh, for calf uh, endotracheal tube, whether it is straight tube or whether it is a preformed tube? Okay. For the sizing, well, in general, when we use the calf tube, whether the preformed or the straight tube, we usually use one size smaller. But um, in the studies that uh, I, I have shown, they said that for the, the micro calf tube, they mm -hmm. uh, use, they can use um, one size higher than uh, for the usual tube. Um, uh, also, there's a comment here that uh, because of that, um, he said um, for Dr. Ben Leong Tai that uh, should replace all the old design pediatric ETs uh, with a micropath in less than two years of at the first yes. instance. Yes. Um, so, actually, in my institution, we don't have yet the microcap tube. We have the ray tube with the usual uh, conventional tube with the Murphy eye, and it is not the low pressure cuff. So I have not used the microcap tube, but I have a friend in another hospital in the Philippine General Hospital, a pediatric anesthesiologist, and she said that she has since. Um, been uh, for the past three years, been using the micro calf tube. So always the calf tube for not just for palatoplasty, but even in other cases. So yeah, but the sizing, I read from what I read in the journal that they usually use one size larger with the micro calf tube than uh, the usual. Okay, but the advantage really is in the uh, in the micro calf tube is that it is low pressure, high volume calf, uh, and the um, calf is placed more distally because the Murphy eye has been removed, and because of that, there is less chance of the calf being placed in the subglottic zone or even in between the vocal cords, and this lessens the possibility of post extubation stridor. Yes, and if you look at the external diameter of the micro calf tubes, they are actually smaller for the same size in for the for the for example portex tubes. So the external diameter is only the cuff, which is should be below the glottis anyway. Yes. Uh, what about uh, maybe we'll ask about um, do you use uh, micro calf tubes uh, serpil, uh, in Turkey or do you use calf uh, tubes in young children in Turkey? Yes. Uh, we use yeah, uh, cuff tubes in Turkey, uh, not micro cuffs, uh, but we use cuff tubes in small babies, in cleft palates especially. Uh, three and a half, uh, three and a half point five uh, um, external diameter uh, cuff tubes. We uh, this um, spiral tubes, reinforced ones, but not rare ones. Uh, because the rare ones uh, getting out easily, so we use rare ones, um, um, reinforced ones. Well, that is for you're talking about palatoplasties. Yes, uh, what for about palatoplasties. For non, non airway, um, you know, in non airway surgery. surgery. Uh, non airway surgery, we use uh, uncuffed ones. 
Okay. What about Pichaya in Thailand? Do you use cuff tubes in the infants? Uh, we do use cuff tube in some situations because um, because of the prices too, I, I would say. Um, the price of cuff tube in Thailand is a little bit, no, not a little bit, it's far way higher than the standard non cuff tube. So in some cases, like uh, the case that we have to 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 make sure that the airway should be sealed completely, like uh, uh, an EGD or something that we kind of are uh, aware of aspiration or if the patient uh, uh, come in for surgery that will have uh, changing in lung compliance, for example, like laparoscopic surgery, we sometimes consider putting um, a cuff tube in that patient, or if the patient is going to be uh, in, so to going to have surgery in prone position, that uh, the lung compliance will be maybe change. So we uh, we we put a cuff tube in that kind of patient. But um, for the micro cuff uh, in neonates, it's quite uh, good, and uh, sometimes it's just really difficult to find. Uh, the micro cuff in Thailand. So um, for neonates, uh, we still have have some problems because sometimes we have shortage of my own micro cuff supply. Okay. So with that, th thank you. I'd like to thank all the panelists again because time is up for sharing your cases. Because like I said, in less competent hands, it can become a nightmare. So thank you, Oli. Thank you, Pichaya. Thank you, Serpil. Thank you, Tess Law. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hope to see you in Istanbul next year. I hope to see you. You're all welcome. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.